I'm, uh, pleased, we're pleased to have Michael Bongiorno with us today. Uh, he's the Director and Design Principal at Design Group uh, in, in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, they're a gold medal architecture and design firm. Um, he's noted as a local design leader with focus on community impact, uh, mission-driven architecture that supports and enhances the fabric of the city and furthers a fundamental belief that great design is the essential building block to vibrant, healthy communities. His work has garnered national recognition, most recently named, uh, named the Wall Street Journal's Best, of, uh, Ar Best Architecture of 2015 for the design of Columbus's Museum of, Art, uh, Museum of Arts, Margaret M. Walter Wing. His current projects include the Franklin Park Conservatory, uh, Master Plan Implementation, the City of Columbus's uh, Coleman Government Center, and the Ohio State University Jameson Crane Sports Medi Medicine Institute. Recently completed award-winning projects include the Columbus Museum of Art Expansion, the Tell Darby Creek Nature Center, the McConnell Arts Center of Worthington, the Grange Institute Audubon Center, and the John R. Maloney Health and Wellness Center. He serves on the Board of Trustees of the Greater Columbus Arts Council and established Columbus's Design Weeks while serving on the Board of Trustees for the Columbus Center for Architecture and Design, where he led the award-winning CBUS Idea Book and CBUS photo projects. Michael has presented and written extensively on design and creative placemaking, and his 2012 TEDx Columbus talk entitled Looking Over the Overlooked, uh, which really is one of the things that kind of uh, begins to uh, exemplify some of his work, um, took the audience on a journey to discover new ways of reimagining cities. <clears throat> Again, born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, He's a cum laude graduate of the prestigious Pratt Institute School of Architecture in New York and has lived and traveled extensively abroad. Uh, please welcome uh, Michael Bongiorno. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Good job. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. It's great to be here tonight. I'm um, looking forward to uh, sharing some thoughts with you. Uh, as Chris had mentioned, um, you know, I'm going to kind of uh, frame the topic around the idea of sort of mission-driven architecture, and um, I'm going to take a little bit of a sort of a non-traditional approach. This is not going to be like a portfolio review, and it's not necessarily going to be everything about the philosophy of a particular work product, uh, but uh, more about an approach to thinking about who we are as architects and how the things that we do, uh, both beyond bricks and mortar and with bricks and mortar, um, have a lot to do to inform each other, and I think especially as young architects, understanding what that is and, and how you can create a meaningful role as a leader uh, either when, within your communities or abroad. Um, uh, and so the thing, I'm going to kind of divide things into two parts. The first part um, is more about sort of uh, the discussion about what happens beyond bricks and mortar. And the second part I'm going to be talking specifically within the context of one project uh, that I feel culminates a number of years of work and thinking uh, relative to some of our, our design uh, philosophies. Um, our firm um, is located uh, in, in Columbus, Ohio. Um, that's where our headquarters are. We're about a 50-person firm. Uh, we've been around since the early 70s, um, and uh, since that time, very early on, um, we've done a lot of um, sustainable architecture. Uh, one of our uh, founding principles uh, uh, made that part of the DNA of our organization, and what that uh, allowed us to do is to understand uh, how to uh, capitalize on natural elements, not just for their quantitative uh, characteristics, but a lot of the qualitative as well, uh, and what the emotional benefits are and the psychological benefits are, the thinking about in depth, how you study material, how you study light, um, and so on. Um, you know, I, and as Chris had mentioned, we're very much focused on putting our clients' uh, mission uh, at the forefront and really doing a deep dive with them. Um, and thinking about becoming part of their organization so that the DNA of their organization is the thing that is the signature of the project. Um, so we don't have a signature approach to our work. Uh, our approach to our work is to really become one with our clients and then uh, help, help the building. The building becomes a manifestation of that. Um, and so all of our work that's consistent with. And so across any work that we do, there's nothing that really looks necessarily the same as each other. Um, a lot of it has to do with um, the client, and so the building looks like it does for them and for no one else, and specifically the context. The building exists where it does, uh, as if it grew out of the ground there and nowhere else. And so it's a really important consideration. 
Um, you know, there's a number of products that we have on the boards right now that, that further exemplify that um, and that will be built within the next couple of years or just recently com been completed. Um, so on the subject of bricks and mortar, you know, uh, when um, a few years ago, uh, actually my wife and I, uh, through the Center for Architecture and Design, in, including uh, a number of colleagues from uh, my company, uh, came up with the idea of having a design festival in Columbus. Uh, we never had something like that before. It was just kind of a thought, you know, to do something different and new. Um, and the goal was to try to help elevate the level of conversation about design and the importance of it to our communities um, for the general sort of population. Um, and, and it was a way for us to also explore ideas about cross-sector collaboration so that we're not working in such silos as, you know, architecture, landscape architecture, interior design, uh, um, graphic design, um, uh, industrial design, um, even planning, engineering, and all that. Like, and, and, and when you look to expand it beyond that to include film and the performing arts, uh, we were looking at it creating this kind of uh, collective engagement uh, with our community through a series of, of projects. Um, one of those, and so as part of Design Week, uh, which started in 2012 as a week, and then we felt a little more ambitious the next year, and it became a month, <laughs> which is either ambition or insanity. Um, but one of our first projects was something called the Idea Book Project. And uh, what we did is we created 500 um, uh, of these little orange booklets um, that were little sketchbooks, almost like little moleskins. And um, we uh, sent them out to the community. And by the community, I mean the mayor, um, leaders of educational institutions, leaders of industry, architects, interior designers, graphic designers. And the, the directions are very simple. Um, what do you imagine, and it could be anything, what are your dreams for Columbus um, in the coming years? Um, just fill out your book, return it to us, and then we're gonna have an incredible display of it, and then we'll see where that takes us moving forward. So without having done this before, we just put these books together, we mailed them out. Um, we received back um, about 200 of them, so about half of, uh, a little bit less than half of what we had sent out, which is a pretty good hit rate, I think. Um, which is interesting because uh, that was the same year as Columbus's bicentennial, which was 200. So there was something kind of uh, poetic about that. Um, is Sarah Kay here? She's not here, is she? No. Um, anyway, Gwen Burlakamp, you can see there. The books came back, and what we did was um, we assembled groups from the School of Architecture. So there was a, a program at uh, the Knowlton School of Architecture in Ohio State called Servitecture. Uh, there were students from that. There were students from the AIS. And they helped us to put together and uh, sort out and uh, build the displays. We built actually custom rolling display boards uh, that had uh, cable mounted displays with retractable um, uh, uh, cable mounted uh, fixtures that had the number of the books on them uh, in addition to um, the books themselves. We then, um, so what we received back was a great kind of cross section of ideas. And, and you know, we received things from architects that were specifically architectural ideas. Um, we received things from uh, graphic designers that were sort of graphic novels or uh, elaborate maps uh, or just in beautifully kind of uh, celebratory uh, imagery uh, for the city. Uh, we had people who manipulated the books beyond what you know, we had originally thought that they would, uh, making cutouts of them or making pop-up books. Um, and actually this one here is a book that was cut down to such a small size they turned into a little flip book. So there's a little cartoon in there showing uh, you know, proposed developments for the city, which was really clever. <clears throat> Other people just shared ideas and aspirations, uh, one of which may have been building a giant body of water in Columbus, Ohio and create surfing opportunities on it, or just aspirations for a greater sustainable city. Um, a lot of it was uh, introspective, you know, are we uh, a wonder bread town or are we, uh, you know, some other kind of bread town? And so, uh, and, and people imagined, uh, um, you know, headlines for the future. Um, so it was a really great, uh, fun exercise, and then we invited kids as well. We went to high schools, um, and you know, you know, be, watch out, be careful what you ask for. Uh, I don't know why they, they crossed out braided hair, but you know, but uh, I want all the buildings to have hair, which is a really kind of funny way to kind of engage kids in thinking about things. Um, there are actually the people that are young at heart. You'll see that Jeff and Cindy are both 41 and 38, um, and you know what happens in uh, uh, Columbus, and maybe this happens here is after a big football game, people burn cars. Does that happen here? Maybe not. <laughs> you flip cars at least? So, uh, you know, they, they, and they work for the museum, they said, well, what if we, after a great gallery opening, we burned cars? It was, you know, fantastical stuff. 
Uh, we had a great exhibition. Um, it was like something out of a, one of those movies where you don't think anyone's going to show up, and then suddenly you have 600 people at a tiny gallery. The uh, amount of embrace that the community had for this project was phenomenal, and it really helped elevate a conversation about design, I think, that had never happened in Columbus before, and all because we had some crazy idea that you know, we wanted to have a little book project. Um, I think the important takeaway here is it involved a lot of young people and a leadership role in this that um, may not have had an outlet for this kind of thing uh, in their day jobs, which is not a wrong thing or anything, but their bosses let them you know, spend time and students were able to spend some time to really work together and learn how to make a project like this happen. Um, you can see kind of some of the, the books on display uh, and hanging. We really celebrated the artists too. Each um, artist had their own um, name tag with their book number on it, so you would kind of start a conversation and uh, you know, show each other each other's books, and it was great. Um, as Chris had mentioned, uh, in 2012, at the same time, uh, for some uh, reason, I uh, took part in uh, TEDx Columbus, which is um, a, a, a speaking engagement. And um, I, my talk was about, it was called Looking Over the Overlooked, and it was about um, being an opportunist about um, s overlooked spaces throughout a city. Um, and we basically, I took, I took everyone on a tour. I mean, it was kind of an international kind of scale conversation, but I, I took the audience, because it was Columbus, on a tour of Columbus's uh, underutilized spaces and asked people to just think differently and not to, to, to question what they see, because <clears throat> I bet most people look at the world around them um, and think that everything's been designed. And a lot of us know that, no, everything's not been designed, not everything's been thought through. Everything, a lot of, there are a lot of things that are residual that could be greater than they are uh, today. So um, I took a, 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 bunch of, a look at a bunch of different um, interchange systems in the highway. I looked at uh, abandoned lots and industrial sites. Um, one of the sites that I, I kind of zeroed in on, um, and if you can see it here, um, this is uh, High Street, our main thoroughfare through Columbus. Oops. Um, and going over that, um, where, where Columbus passes over, I'm going to use my hand, sorry. Where Columbus passes over I-670, which is a, our inner loop, um, there was a, a, a bridge, uh, there was a bridge there at one time that was turned into a building cap. It was a phenomenal idea. It was like Ponte Vecchio, and they lined it with uh, you know, development on either side. Pesky problem, um, there were two uh, concrete triangles that no one then, you know, decided to do anything with, and so there were these sort of deadly spaces uh, weird spaces in the middle of what is one of the most highest rent districts in the city of Columbus with a very elaborate Greek church across the street and then all this sort of gingerbread kind of development here. So, um, you know, the, I, the idea was to ask people to, to think differently and about what that could be in the future. What that ended up doing was inspiring the next year's collective engagement project, which was called CBUS Photo. And CBUS Photo, CBUS is Columbus. Um, photo was Friends of the Overlooked. It was a name that one of the uh, younger people in the audience uh, came up with. And what we did was we said, okay, we're gonna, fo we're gonna have a photography sort of contest, go and photograph all of these spaces, and we're gonna have a show with the photographs, and we're gonna put them on display. Um, and so people went around, they, they had some great photographs they collected, uh, and things that you know, none of us, some of us never you know, noticed or saw before, uh, but became new to us. Um, and then we actually had an exhibition where we took over an abandoned warehouse and we had like this kind of like design rave in there, I guess is what you call it, um, where we, we displayed all of the, the work. There was like music, there was, there was drinking. Uh, it was a great time. And again, people came together um, around design. We took the content from that and then um, we had these things that were called Photoshops where we went out to, um, we, we, we received a grant to bring uh, professional artists on board uh, to work with um, members of the community. We had groups that went to um, uh, retirement homes and we worked with some of the aged um, and got them thinking about things, which was incredibly exciting for them. Uh, we went to a, a number of school districts and worked with them. We also solicited <clears throat> you know, the professional design community for ideas as well. And you know, some of the artists' work was, was really great. You know, uh, Adam Brule is a local artist that came up with this idea for this raised dish park that was in a residual space between some existing buildings uh, that was really clever. Um, there was an underpass that uh, an, uh, an artist named Cindy Bellarose working with the group. She actually was the, she was just the medium for the ideas of the group uh, to create this kind of uh, 
adult style uh, you know, playground uh, under an overpass. And the, under the same overpass, um, actually, this is a, a rail line that goes over it. Um, Boriana uh, was an artist that created something called Cosmic Bocce. Every time a train would pass, um, the lights of, uh, that would come on in the, the, the ceiling of this space. Um, so it was a way to take the idea of bocce, which is this kind of outdoor sport uh, that happens in cities, and uh, incorporate some interesting elements to, into it. Um, a guy named Dave, uh, Cliff, Clint Davis came up with an idea for occupying that cap that I was showing you a little bit earlier. Um, this was another clever one that occupied that same space. It's called the uh, bike in, and um, with the, 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 the suggestion is that movies play as long as you pedal. So there's this idea that you're incorporating this kind of physical activity into it as well. So I, these are all kind of really clever and fantastical things. The architecture community came up with equally incredible things. Um, and uh, one, of this, one of them was the Climumbus um, to occupy that cap. And I think he, his desire was actually to have the founding fathers of the city there. But, you know, how can you beat Mount Rushmore? Um, you know, th thinking about, uh, you know, underpasses along the river and turning them into kind of like uh, swing parks and that kind of thing. Um, and even architects providing some commentary. Uh, this actually was called the Hand of the Architect. So it's really interesting as you look at it for a while to think about uh, the architect's hand in kind of urban planning and where we may have done well and we may have not done well. Um, and then there were simple things like artists imagining uh, turning uh, local grain silos into... Um, you know, just great graphic elements within the city. So, um, you know, that, that kind of uh, is a message about what we can do as individuals and leaders with a basis in design to help uh, foster conversation in the community, to help raise awareness of design, um, and then to kind of figure out how to work together. Um, what I want to talk about now is um, the work that we did for uh, the Columbus Museum of Art. Uh, the wing just opened the, uh, less than a year ago in October of uh, 2015. And uh, the project um, is sort of a culmination of a lot of touch points that I think are important to us in our practice um, and really kind of exemplify the idea of uh, mission-driven architecture. The, uh, the building site itself um, is you know, in downtown Columbus, within the Central Business District, off of Broad Street, which is Route 40. And Route 40 was a sort of famous um, uh, early highway route that went across the country. Um, and it's located also within what's called the Discovery District of Columbus. Um, and particularly within the Discovery District is an area called the Creative Campus, within which resides the Columbus College of Art and Design, the Columbus Museum of Art, uh, Columbus State Community College. Um, and so the, the building kind of anchors a corner Excuse me. Building anchors a corner here um, at the corner of Broad and Washington. It's on the north uh, side of Broad Street. Um, CCAD is located here. Um, uh, Columbus College of Art and Design, Columbus State Community College, and all of their current parking lots are located here. And then there are a lot of other businesses here, um, including some insurance companies. Um, and the thing that the museum struggled with, right? So all clients come to you with, with a need. Uh, but their need was beyond what the actual physical project kind of uh, suggested and what the physical need was. Um, the museum, um, in fact, is as an institution in terms of their culture and, and their mission, is actually at the vanguard of a lot of museums. It's not a big museum. It's a small museum. It's probably one of the small. I think, I think with this edition, we're now as big as Dayton, which is a much smaller city. But um, the museum has done a lot with regard to building programming around uh, the core mission of teaching about creativity and the value of creative thinking and design thinking, which is something that's missing from the curriculum of, of a lot of uh, uh, primary education uh, systems. And they are looking, they're, they're doing things with the collection in terms of um, uh, interpretation of the collection with the public that I think a lot of other institutions aren't doing or haven't had to do because, for example, um, you know, they've, they may have a destination collection and people come for that destination collection. Or you're the MoMA, and you have a steady influx of um, European tourists that are willing to pay good money to come to your institution. So they don't, we don't have the tourist dollars. Um, and so what the museum has served as is a community resource um, to help build a sense of community among people around the arts um, and that mission. Um, and I want to read to you what their sort of um, uh, educational uh, statement about their mission is in terms of creativity. 
Um, and this is something that's really important. To speak to the culture of a city is to describe its way of life. The Columbus Museum of Art is where creativity and the daily life of our community intersect and thrive. As we champion new and different ways of thinking and doing, we celebrate the creative process and provide opportunities for people to cultivate and discover the value of creativity in their own lives. So the pesky problem for the museum was, and this is something they stated, was that they had all this internal dynamism. Their, their leaders, their, their people there were incredible thinkers. Um, they had great programming. And what they said was, the outside museum does not match the inside museum. And they meant that both literally and figuratively. So part of the big mission of what we try to help them kind of discover was this idea of what is that, when someone says to you the outside and the inside don't match, you're not literally thinking that they're going to try to match up. It's how do you take that energy that they have and, and, and somehow put it on display um, and make it a thing that becomes an incredibly dynamic uh, force so that the museum can function as an intersection between art, uh, the physical city, and, and its citizens. And that's kind of what we uh, try to discover with them. So let me kind of give you, I'll take you a, uh, through a brief walk through this. Um, on the north side of the building in the 1970s was um, uh, an addition um, that was put on the building and it had changed uh, the location of the entrance over time. Um, and it generally fell within sort of brutalist period architecture, but I would argue that in terms of brutalism, it was not A-grade brutalism. It was, it was kind of perfunctory. Um, and the experience of the visitor uh, approaching uh, this building was less than optimal. I mean, you would, you, this, is, this is basically in the Midwest, right? We drive places, so there was a parking lot. You park your car there. The historic entrance was still in operation, but just people didn't use it because it, there's no... There's not a lot of street activity on Broad Street in Columbus. Um, and you would, you would get out of your car, you would, you would stumble uh, through uh, pea gravel um, uh, toward the main entrance, and there were these sort of um, gravel-covered stairs or a strange ramp, and then you'd enter the building through a, a tiny little portal. Um, and the payoff when you got in the building was this really dark, um, cave-like space. Um, which, you know, for the museum was not, when you think about the first chapter of your story, <laughs> wasn't the optimal experience for, for the visitor, uh, both local or traveling. Um, and wayfinding, you know, clarity of wayfinding, trying to understand how you got around the building was very difficult. Uh, there was no sense of uh, a there there. Um, it was just kind of uh, a place uh, where you had to ask for how to make decisions. Um, and uh, in terms of its... Uh, Retail functions as well, I and mean, retail functions are very important to, to museums, as are event functions, but their cafe was in the basement um, with no access to natural light, um, and their store was in a little cubby kind of off of the lobby, and so none of those things uh, help to celebrate the museum in a different way. You know, you should be able to uh, be inspired when you're in the cafe in some way, you know, even if you're there just to have a sandwich. Um, so, but the museum did come with us with very sort of discrete needs. Um, they needed a new, they wanted a new entry experience. Um, they needed a new special exhibition space. They, you know, their, their uh, traveling shows would come to a, a sort of undersized space. Um, and a big portion, a big issue with the traveling shows as well was that um, there was no enclosed loading dock. And so they weren't able to be lent uh, pieces because um, they couldn't have a contained condition loading dock. Uh, it's funny but that basically without that enclosed loading dock, it's such a like a seems like a minor thing. Without that enclosed loading dock, this entire project couldn't have happened. Um, they also needed uh, contemporary collection galleries. The existing uh, historic 1931 wing was where all the per permanent work was. The 1974 wing was where all the traveling uh, shows went. That meant that if they were to acquire large contemporary works, <clears throat> they would have to dismantle entire galleries. Uh, domestically scaled galleries, of which there were about 12. Um, and so what ended up happening is in order to display their uh, contemporary collection, they had to arrange it like salon style. And, and, and what I mean by that is a, a number of images on the wall uh, close to each other uh, and, and somewhat not arranged. And so, uh, except for some of the, the curation of it in terms of the story. And so that was difficult because contemporary works are very large, they need some breathing room, um, a lot of them are very physical and have dimension, um, and it was very difficult to accommodate that in the building. So they needed a new contemporary gallery uh, space. 
Um, and and it, the other thing that's very important to uh, a Midwestern museum um, is uh, our events, because revenue streams, again, um, Columbus is interesting. You know, I, I was joking that it's, it's between the Bengals and the Browns. You know, Cleveland is old kind of industrial robber baron money, and Cincinnati is old southern money, and Columbus is neither, right? And so our, our endowments in Columbus are not what they are in some of these um, older cities. So there's a lot of creativity that has to go into thinking about how you uh, design buildings around other revenue streams, one of which is events. And so they had a historic event space that couldn't handle the capacity that they wanted to, to have larger events, and so they wanted to build upon that. Um, and then finally, a, a new um, uh, sculpture garden that actually connected somehow with the experience of the museum in a uh, uh, kind of holistic way. The previous sculpture garden was literally a side door on the building that you would exit and, and having to find. It was actually a beautiful garden. Um, it's what I proposed to my wife, by the way. But um, the, uh, the issue with it was that um, it just it wasn't utilized as much as it could be. Uh, and it wasn't built upon, uh, building upon program that it could have. So um, as we, you know, when I, when I mentioned earlier this idea of like doing a deep dive, like we, we challenged the museum, we asked them very, you know, specific questions about um, who they wanted to be, what they wanted to do, what this museum meant. And the building, it's what ended up the design of the entire facility ended up being in a way an answer to those questions. Um, and so one of them was, you know, how does the new addition interior engage with the public realm in a way that the original building was never able to. Think about it, it was, the original building was a Beaux-Arts building. It was a beautiful building that was very inwardly focused, which was appropriate for when it was designed, right? But how do you, in the new wing, uh, do something different than that? Um, how do you provide communal spaces that blur the boundary between the public and private realm? So it's not a matter of just saying you're going to have some you know, type of a device like a window that does that, but how do you programmatically do that? Um, the other thing is it's really tricky to add to historic buildings, you know, in a way that um, doesn't insult it by copying it, but doesn't overwhelm it by, um, um, you know, becoming so foreign to it. So one thought is like, how do you use timeless um, materials in a, in a new way uh, that, could, that could have a dialogue with the building, that, that can complement the historic structure while still contrasting with it? Um, and how do you harness the poetics of, of natural light um, and still protect the art? I will get into the sort of lighting idea in a little while, but um, lighting and uh, n natural lighting and understanding of it and the way that it operates is fundamental to the, the way that we work. It's, 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 it's core to the philosophy of our organization, not just in terms of performance, but in terms of experience. Um, and really, how should a museum edition in 21st century really Colum in Columbus, 21st century Columbus really function? Um, so we, we did sort of what you would typically do with a client and where we, we, we went through the very kind of like uh, somewhat mundane process of cataloging everything they had, everything they needed, um, and coming up with non-architectural relationships of spaces, right? I mean, you guys have probably all seen these kind of flow diagrams. There's, there, these are instructions for something, it's like a DNA for some kind of architecture that can happen. But there's no line that you can draw between this and, and the building. It's just a collection of how things should work together in terms of function, uh, relationship to, to the front door, relationship to other elements and components. Um, and we started kind of um, drawing through and iterating. You know, we still kind of sketch things by hand. So these are really dirty little doodles. Uh, and thinking about strategies uh, for um, locating the addition, for how to you know, think about the entry, to create an organizing element that was really clear. And we ended up with one that we had affectionately at the time uh, referred to as the uh, shard of light, which is here, which is kind of this kind of spine that separates the new wing uh, from the existing uh, cluster, which we had completely had to dispense with immediately because apparently uh, Daniel Liebeskin has got a, a copyright on the word shard, so we had to step away from that. <laughs> um, and so we started kind of studying that in model. We were studying what that could, you know, what, could, what that could be kind of uh, as a space, just in very rudimentary ways. Um, and, and thinking about, you know, how a space like this can be uh, a connector and a separator, uh, an organizer, um, a space where people can queue um, for shows. Previously the, in the museum, they were queuing through the galleries before they got, so you saw the show before you saw the show, which was a completely bizarre idea. But if you had a blockbuster show like a, 
a Monet and Matisse show, you know, people were lined up out of the door and would have to wind through the building. And so, uh, and, and thinking about a way, a way that the new addition could somehow <clears throat> have some kind of space hyphen between it and the uh, original building uh, in order to not compete. So um, what you're seeing here is kind of a uh, sort of preliminary kind of early site plan. And what the, the general arrangement of things is that um, this is the front, the historic front lawn of the building and historic entry into the building. Uh, this is Broad Street. Um, there's an older church here, uh, the First Congregation Church, which, a, which is a very <clears throat> uh, early church that um, accommodated uh, African-American communities in Columbus. It was one of the first ones in Columbus that did. Um, the expansion primarily runs along Washington here. <clears throat> um, so the 1931 building, this is a renovation which we slightly added to, um, and then the concourse uh, of light here. The entry to the building then is defined here by this sort of entry walk and forecourt. Um, and then the sculpture garden is then to the north of uh, the renovation of 1974 wing, um, and it's served by some parking, which could and will be future expansion space. So the idea of expansion is that there's somehow in the future we could potentially ring uh, an entire courtyard around the entire um, facility. Baton Hall here uh, is where the current administration uh, resides in the building in the, for the museum. So the museum director and all our staff are there. Um, the, the idea is pretty simple, um, and I'll kind of go over this in a little bit, but um, really it's a long bar of gallery space um, on two floors, um, a portion of which the first floor is a retail store, um, and it's separated from the, uh, the new wing by this concourse of light. <clears throat> and then the 74 building on the first floor uh, is, a, is a mix of what I'm calling back of house, and for security reasons I can't show this to you. Um, but uh, there's also a, 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 a cafe here. That cafe um, has an operable wall here that opens up and spills out onto a terrace that overlooks the sculpture garden. Both the, the, um, the retail store and the, this function, uh, the cafe, are located where they are to activate that ground floor plane. And this becomes a very great sort of merchandising opportunity for the museum at that level. Um, the uh, museum store itself, and you'll see some photographs of it, I'm sorry, the, the cafe has a vitrine, a glass vitrine within it, uh, within which are pieces from the collection that are not curated, but that are on display for the general public uh, to see. This uh, sculpture garden here is actually a public park. The city underwrote it, um, and so it becomes a, a space that is accessed and used by anybody from any part of the city, anytime they want, as long as the museum is open. These functions here, uh, are also considered semi-public because they're all pre-ticket. So that idea that you're blurring the boundaries between um, the building program and the public realm um, really exists in, in, in one form here. Um, as you make your way down here toward the gallery, and something I'll talk about in a little while, is the, the north and south facades of the building are primarily glass. And then the east and way, east, um, primary east facade here is primarily solid. Uh, with some interventions, inter interventions of glass. And so that was a very strategic thing that we uh, determined. Um, on the upper floor, the gallery is one large tube of space that runs north-south. Um, all the walls that you see in this space right now only hold up themselves and the artwork that's on them. So that, let's say, there was a, <clears throat> a Richard Serra exhibition that wanted to come to Columbus, and they wanted to clear out that entire tube, they could do that. And so our goal in designing those galleries is to design as flexible and, and simple and open a space as possible. Um, which is, in, in a way, sort of a subversion of ego as you're like thinking about doing the architecture. Um, uh, the other thing that we did here is when we thought about the, um, the new, this is the new event space here, uh, our idea was to come up with something that was called the uh, uh, special event spine. And the, the thought is that, uh, Traditionally, for events, there was valet drop-off at the historic entrance. Um, so you could have an event that would start at that entrance and work its way through the building and end in the garden. So the idea is that this, you, you're taking in the entire experience as part of, of that event, of the museum. And, and in fact, as you're standing here, the sight lines are, as you're standing there looking left and right, because there's glass on both ends, that you could see both Broad Street and Gay Street in that way. So the, the sense of kind of visual connectivity between them. Uh, became important. And so th this is the kind of sense that you get of how that works. And they're actually, as you come into the building, um, and this building, the 1931 building, was renovated in 2011 by a preservation firm called Schooley Caldwell. I don't know if any of you are familiar with them. They've done a number of state houses across the country. 
but um, there's a, a skylight here, um, and you make your way in from that larger volume, and you're compressed into this volume a bit. Uh, we cut an incision into the existing roof here and, and sort of sloped the ceiling so there was a sort of panoramic kind of opening of this so that there's a great sort of panoramic view uh, of the north end of Columbus from there. Um, <clears throat> but here's one of the things I, 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 I want to kind of talk about, and that is uh, like how our conception of the experience of the space. Because truly, we, what we designed the... The design of the building was designed around the experience of the individual moving through it. And the way we thought about it was the way a cinematographer would think about how we, he thinks of the film, right? So we, we storyboarded. And so what you're looking at here is sort of um, uh, a map, right? And that ma on that map are a series of key frames. And at those key frames are very specific intentional moments about uh, framing views uh, outside of the building, uh, from the inside of the building out and outside of the building in. Um, in between all those key points um, are other experiences that you can have. There are other intentional key frame moments. But when we were designing the building, we actually walked through each of these spaces uh, with uh, our client and um, we identified what were the critical uh, key points and what the, what the critical views and we designed the building around that kind of experience. Uh, and you'll see what some of those are in a minute. One of those um, was an idea that we had for both the north and the south faces of the building, uh, and th those were called cinematic facades. And the idea was that um, the, uh, uh, for the museum visitor, um, as you're in the space um, looking out, you're experiencing the life of the city outside of the museum, right? You're, you're, you're now, there's that kind of blurred boundary between that public realm and the space that you're occupying. At the same time, uh, the passerby, whether they be on a bicycle or a car, uh, a bus, experiences the life of the museum and the activity and the movement of it. So you can see people moving around, looking at the collection, moving across um, a series of bridges um, between the old and the new building. And at, and at night, it's illuminated so that the idea is that um, the, muse the collection, uh, the exhi exhibition never ends. The collection is part of the experience of the um, uh, living room of the city, which is the public realm. Does that make sense? Um, so we really, there are four, four uh, uh, key planning gestures uh, with this project. Um, the, we wanted a central organizing element, which we call that light concourse, or the shard of light, which I can't say. Um, the idea that we're connecting the surrounding context, this idea of <clears throat> cinematic facades, um, reinforcing and building upon historic Derby Court um, with the event spine, and really defining a campus, which the museum did not have the definition of. And the way that we did that is creating that urban forecourt um, and that frame garden. Um, and so as we kind of looked at some of the planning uh, gestures, we started thinking about you know, building form and we were sketching and we were doing light studies and, and, and ink wash studies, uh, just constantly iterating through it. Like I said, we work between hand sketches and, and, and digital works as well. Um, and so, but you know, and for each of these sketches, there was some, you know how it is, there's a mountain of sketches that end up on the cutting room floor. But, you know, we were digging through some of our older sketches, and, and this is the one that, you know, was kind of the genesis sketch that we, it ended, the building ended up being. Um, we also studied it, <clears throat> it um, three-dimensionally in model form. We were thinking about um, the appearance of the building in the evening, because uh, what's really important, I think, uh, and I, I hope all architects, I think architects are getting a lot better at this, is that idea, uh, and I mean this in a good way, that, the building has multiple personalities, right? It's, it's, in the daytime, it has a specific uh, impact and character. In the evening, um, it has a different ability to kind of impact and character, and that could be defined by light. Um, another thing that we intensely dove into uh, was um, how we thought about materials. And we, we really spent a lot of time researching a number of materials um, across the board. Um, and nothing was really resonating uh, as much as, as we wanted it to. I mean, obviously, uh, we had looked at even uh, weathering steel, uh, and one of the board members said, I am not going to be the board member that approved the Rusty Building and Rusty Museum in Columbus, Ohio. Um, but one thing we ended up kind of uh, thinking about and gravitating toward is um, copper. And it was something that we hadn't intended to kind of uh, incorporate into the building, but we thought about the DNA of the existing building and the, con the neighborhood context. Uh, in fact, on the existing building, there actually is quite a bit of bronze detailing. Um, as you know, uh, bronze is a copper alloy. 
and uh, there were actually a number of uh, sculptures as well. And so, um, and then we stepped back from the museum, the specific museum context, and we looked at the buildings in the neighborhood. And you know, we noticed that in the first congregation church, there's this beautifully naturally patinated copper. Um, and actually, there's a church across the street that was kind of a slightly green-hued stone. All the rest of the buildings around it were limestone. Um, so one of the things that we did was we thought about how we would riff on uh, the existing context materials. So the original building is Indiana limestone laid in a running bond pattern. And in the new addition, the, the, uh, the material is limestone laid in a, a stack bond pattern, much more kind of linear. Um, and you'll see that we took the um, idea of the prepatinated copper and we move forward with that looking at um, its patterning. And so the museum wasn't convinced of copper. I mean, actually, no one was. Um, it was a hard sell, uh, which was a little bit of a mystery, but it was a very foreign and it was a very conservative board. So, you know, we had done a number of studies and a lot of different materials, and, and really for every, every, you know, each nine of these, um, there were 20 other studies that we did of the elevations. Um, and we had someone in our office kind of uh, creating scripts for how we would uh, individually treat the, the articulation of the, the panels. Um, and no one was buying it. Um, we had all the material samples we shared with them. So I said, okay, uh, look, uh, I'm not going to uh, force you to do this. So let's make the decision as a group. And I'm going to take you to a project that I think has something similar to it. And after like, we visit that place, if you still don't like it, we won't, you know, we, we're not going to keep bugging you about this. So uh, I, I have friends in New York. Do you, are you guys familiar with the firm, Lewis, Termaki Lewis? So um, I, I knew that they did the, uh, the building in Worcester. And um, I told them that I was going to go up there. And, um, and uh, it was, unfortunately, it was a dead of winter in Ohio. <laughs> which was bleak out, but we, we walked up to the building uh, and I stood back and uh, I watched the board members and, and uh, the museum director just kind of walk up to the building and look at it and um, they kind of put their hands on it. Um, and they turned around and they said, yeah, yeah, this is what we want. We don't want anything else. This is, we want copper on our building. So it was a great moment, I think, of helping your client understand uh, physically and, and you know, through you know, look, see, feel, and touch how to make a decision, and we, we kind of owe that to them uh, to do that. Um, this, this actually wasn't, this is us looking at material samples, but this is the uh, assistant director of the museum, but it was a similar kind of thing, like, oh, I get it now. I can, I can experience it um, in person. Okay, so then we, just to make sure we kind of wrap things up as well, we study the material relative to different stones and uh, thinking about how uh, that all would work. Unfortunately, um, the copper that we had made, um, I think a guy uh, showed up with a mop and some acid and kind of wiped it on the copper and it ended up looking like uh, garbage and almost ended up losing us the, the battle. But um, we actually were able to work with um, and find a, a, a sample from Zaner metals if you're familiar with them. Um, and they ended up, uh, it, this is the star blue uh, patina, which is a proprietary thing for them, um, which ended up being the material that we ended up using on the project. So the, the, really the materials are uh, granite uh, as a base, um, limestone, copper, and a glazing system. And so really simple uh, and elemental approach, which is something that's part of our design philosophy is uh, we have a very elementalist approach to how we do materials and how we think about uh, the, the forms of the building. Um, <clears throat> but then it was like, well, how do you, how, how do you like, what, this is a huge building. Like, how do you uh, create an articulated facade uh, with this material? And so we studied a number of different uh, patterns and, you know, we thought about, you know, how to, you know, what was the most appropriate, um, both as in terms of the top of the building and then the lower portion of the building. Um, and then we started thinking about, once we arrived at a solution on the upper portion, which we felt needed to be the more active kind of facade, we started looking at studying options for the lower base of it, and we arrived at one. And, and so um, that was kind of the process that we used to kind of get there. All along the way, um, we were continually working with our client and continually going back to those touchstones, those questions about what the principles are for this project and how those guiding principles we're going, we were going to cling to them, and we're going to make sure that we kept each other accountable uh, to them moving forward. And so uh, what you're looking at here is the, is the finished product. Um, I'm kind of going to confuse you a little bit because now Broad Street is here, so north is down. Um, but this is the existing 1931 building and, and Derby Court uh, with its skylight. Um, 
This is sort of the uh, renovated uh, 1974 wing with some addition to it. Uh, this, in fact, is the loading dock here. Um, this is the new uh, sculpture <coughs> garden um, and the wing itself. And you'll notice that the wing, um, as it comes in, it comes into contact with the historic wing. There's uh, an L-shaped skylight there that helps bring light into the space, um, as well as a, a, a skylight here uh, to bring light at the entrance to it. Um, and at the roof levels, there are a series of uh, monitors or clear stories um, that bring in uh, northern natural light. Um, the north face of it is primarily um, all glass, uh, as is the south face at either end of the gallery. This is the um, event space that I had mentioned earlier. There's a terrace that comes off of it and a set of stairs that takes you down to the garden. Um, this is the cafe that I had mentioned earlier, um, and this is sort of the entry forecourt and the covered entry walk. Um, the, the, the garden was designed by a, a local design uh, um, landscape architecture firm called MKSK. Um, and the idea of the garden was really three rooms. Um, there was a sycamore grove, uh, which was defined by uh, crushed limestone, um, you know, a, a sculpture in a, in a body of water, um, some other pieces of art from the collection. <clears throat> and how am I doing on time? Pretty good? Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, there's a, a Sycamore Grove, there's an event lawn here, and so there are, the idea is that there are tie downs there, there's technology, um, and then there, uh, there's a quiet space here called the, um, uh, the plane, I'm sorry, the, um, the Birch Walk, so that's a, there's a sound sculpture in that space as well. Um, so the approach to the building, as I mentioned earlier, um, it was really about this idea of a processional experience as a sort of gentle rise um, toward the entry um, where you're kind of coming in from uh, parking on this side of the wall. As you look up here, that kind of pocket of light is the sort of portal that takes you to the garden. Uh, this is the store, this is the upper gallery. Um, as you enter the space, so. This is sort of the anti-cave. The idea is that when you walk into the space that there's this incredibly uplifting feeling and transformational feeling, and there's some kind of payoff as you enter it. And one of the key features of it really is the relationship of the wing um, to the existing 1931 building and how that's all articulated. Um, the way that the buildings connect at the upper levels are a series of bridges. We only made one new intrusion into the 1931 building. So the, the 1931 wing uh, is a beloved uh, local, um, uh, you know, gem, and we wanted to make sure we showed a deference. However, we wanted to weave it into the experience of the galleries, and so there's an experience of moving between the domestically scaled galleries, uh, crossing a threshold uh, that's very active, and then into sort of the larger, bigger quiet of the, um, the main uh, new contemporary gallery spaces. As you look to the right here, um, that is the uh, museum cafe, and you can kind of get a sense of it's a very open kitchen but you get the first hints of the connection to the exterior. Um, and as you look to the left um, is the new um, store. Um, and there's actually a, a sliding kind of discrete um, wall panel that um, allows you to exit from the special exhibition hall through that space. Uh, but you can see they, they really uh, took pride in their, um, the, the pieces that they had for sale and they really curated the space um, well. Um, as you move down the space, um, you know, uh, there are a lot of features that, um, you know, this sort of more solid portion of the ceiling we knew was going, we, we didn't want to have skylight everywhere, although if you were going to have it, it should be in this concourse, but we knew that they were going to have an iconic piece hanging from the ceiling. Um, this piece in particular happens to be Lino Talia Pietra's uh, work. Um, he's a glass artist. He's sort of like the, the more restrained version of Dale Chihuly. <laughs> um, and then from the exterior, kind of the dialogue between old and new became a, uh, a really important part of it. The idea that in the existing building, um, you have this kind of historic structure with a very specific vocabulary, but the new building was able to be uh, a different uh, vocabulary because it was using the language of the same materials. <clears throat> uh, moving up to the upper level, um, you know, the experience is somewhat the same, but the, the thing I want to kind of point out here again is uh, the, the type of movement and activity that occurs, the sense of this space being uh, a central portion of the uh, a return space as you're making your journey through the museum, um, and how we thought about how we can kind of like effectively and sensitively interweave uh, the new and the old became a huge part of the, the discovery. 
of this project and how to, how to do that well and how to make it look like it was easy because this was a very, very complicated project. There was a central plant that exists in that Baton Hall building that I, referred, that I mentioned to you. A lot of the systems actually have to run through the renovated 1974 wing and this portion of the building into the, uh, the new wing. So there was an incredible amount of surgery that went on to make things as thin and as minimal as possible. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, one of the defining features um, of our work is how we work with natural light. And we did sun angle studies of every space uh, in this building. And we thought about things like um, over the course of the day um, and the course of the year, the quality of the light, the intensity of it, um, the color, um, and the volume of it um, changes. And um, you know, when I was uh, I was a student studying in Rome um, in the like uh, I don't know, I think it was like 1990. Um, I uh, the, the you guys familiar with the Pantheon? Obviously, you've studied this, right? So um, that Oculus was an obsession of mine. I would as, as much as possible. I would, I would make my way over to the Pantheon to, to see what the light was doing that day or to, like, to understand like, you know, if it was a cloudy day, what was the sense of that light in the space? If it was later in the day or earlier in the day or you know, depending, we were there for like six months. So that was incredibly impactful. And so I, I try to bring that and think about that experience and how that can affect the people that are in the buildings um, that we design um, over the course of the day and of course of the year. In fact, you know, even when the sun is not shining in this space, the volume of light, of ambient light, is, is in, incredible. I mean, it is like it's internally illuminated. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, and, and we also thought about that as we thought about, you know, how to strategically get light into the galleries without affecting the, the art. Um, I want you to pay attention to that. Can you tell us a horse, a metal horse? <laughs> um, this is Joseph. Uh, the artist is uh, uh, Butterfield. Um, but again, thinking about moving through the building, right, and uh, having uh, vignettes or framed views that connect to different parts of the, the building content as well as the surrounding. So what you're doing is you're standing here and you're looking at the south face of the, the upper gallery, the south face of the lower gallery, and you're making connection between that exterior and the interior as part of a vertical circulation space as you cross it. So you have this kind of snippet of a view. When you come around the wall, then that, that, that piece then becomes, uh, and that wall becomes a backdrop to that piece in a different way. In fact, this slot right here um, has got a nickname. It's called Nanette's Nook, and it's the museum director's favorite spot of the building because she can stand there and look back at the 1931 wing in a way she was never able to do and, and appreciate the detailing on the facade in a way that no one really was able to do. There was actually a freeze board there of uh, a series of... Uh, historic artists kind of, and, and there was no real way to appreciate that from the ground previously. You can also see, and there's a photograph of it, how it frames both the 1931 building and the first congregation church. So you're standing there, you understand the riffing between the new wing and the, the neighborhood buildings in terms of their materiality. Um, <clears throat> the quality of light in the galleries as well, the, the, the proportioning of the spaces, and we work with the, the, the exhibition, uh, the curators, um, to think about this, every time you cross a bridge, uh, you step into a pool of light, or there's an opportunity to walk into a pool of light. So there's a kind of symbolic connection between the old and the new that way. Um, I'll just kind of move through some of these gallery slides uh, because we're kind of tight on time. Um, but, you know, we even had to do uh, custom-built uh, uh, spaces for certain pieces. Um, and what you don't see here is the, actually the walls kind of tilt in and bow slightly. This is Mel Chin, it's a, a piece called Spirit, and it's about the uh, American expansion um, westward and our impact on the environment. This is actually a, a very kind of rare uh, uh, grass here that was used as a woven piece to show that you know, we're straining um, our environment. Um, again, the idea of the cinematic facades that you're experiencing the outside city while you're, while you're in the building. Um, you know, you're, you feel like you're in a bubble of uh, uh, glass outside. Um, and that experience happens um, as you're the passerby, you know, both day and night. Um, and it happens in the uh, cafe. You can see the, uh, the, the glass walls are pulled open. That space all, all of a sudden becomes the room is bigger than the room, right? The room is the entire uh, development. 
um, and how we thought about also the layering of those spaces. Remember, we were talking about framing of views. This is the store beyond. You would see people moving back and forth. The idea that you're, uh, uh, the activity and dynamism of the movement of the people is, is part of the design driver. Uh, stepping back and looking at the event space and, and thinking about how you know, it feels to, to, to move between the two of those um, <clears throat> and experience uh, things on the inside and the outside at the same time. This is a view looking northward in the space where the, the ceiling uh, raises up. And again, uh, coming back to this idea that the building has a presence in the daytime and the evening um, that's completely different uh, and yet completely familiar. And thinking about the building with its backdrop of a big limestone neighbor here and how that, that wing actually helps to create uh, a setting and a, a setting for this gem. It's a really simple setting for what is a very kind of uh, beloved historic gem in the, in the community. And, and coming back to remember that, that original inspiration for where all that came from, standing there one day looking at the existing building relative to its neighbors and what it became uh, over time. Um, so uh, that's sort of uh, an overview of things. Um, I, I really appreciate you guys having me here to, take, to talk about uh, some of what we think about, and um, if we have time for questions, I'd more than happy to, to take some. Uh, real quick, one of the one of the things that um, in this in the context of, of academia, um, one of the things that, that maybe doesn't get taught as much are the processes that we have to go through as architects to uh, to to land at the you know the design of the project, the architecture. Mm -hmm. I think we so heavily focus on, you know, design process, design studio, making architecture, that, you know, we get into practice and don't realize how complicated it really can be to deliver a project in mm -hmm. the end. And I'm wondering, on, on especially a project like this, if there was anything in particular that you implemented in that process as you related to the client. And, and my context for that is thinking about um, working with like a, a design boards with churches. Mm -hmm. They're like notoriously complicated. Um, but I, I'm wondering if in this instance there were any processes that you guys implemented that you think were atypical from how you maybe run other types of uh, smaller or less significant cultural projects. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so uh, a few things. Um, <clears throat> this was a very high profile project in the city of Columbus. There were a lot of eyes on us. Um, and part of those eyes were internal, right? So museums, uh, the director of the museum is not the queen. Uh, she is there at the pleasure of the board. Uh, and so the board of trustees was a very large group of very influential people who had very strong opinions about what they wanted this project to be. Um, there uh, is a downtown review commission in the city of Columbus that reviews all architectural projects. Um, the, the, the museum was seeking uh, some uh, state tax credits for the project, so there was a historic preservation office uh, that we had to think about and, and work with. Um, and obviously there was the critique of the design community locally of the work. Specific to how we work with the museum uh, to help make the process move along in a, in a way that uh, felt everyone was enthusiastic about as well as um, just getting the work done, um, very early on, um, I sat down with the museum director and I said, uh, we had a meeting, it was sort of a some informal kickoff, and I asked her what her biggest fear was. And it was, it was what, kind of what you're describing. Uh, a lot of pressure's on me, I have a lot of eyes on me. I hear a lot of people talking to me, you know, when it's people start talking to me, I start seeing colors. So in a way, I was almost kind of like serving as her psychiatrist, right? She was, she was, she was, she was being very vulnerable with me. So having someone be vulnerable enough to say that they need your help is the first step. And then she, so then we said, well, what is, what is that? What do you do to get there? I said, okay, identify all the people that you think are your key stakeholders, and primarily the ones a that are going to be your biggest advocates and proponents, your strong alpha types, right? And then B, uh, all the complainers. 
right? And, and so um, I said, and we are going to focus on those individuals primarily. Those are the, that's the spectrum, right? The people in the middle will generally sway one way or the other. And so if you are making uh, these people happy and these people happy, especially the sort of the proponents, uh, it makes the project move a lot easier. So we identified those people and we involved them. When I said certain board members went to look at the materials, it was intentional. Those people were there, A, because they were very strong opinions and that could kind of shift the, the, the thinking and they were, uh, to the positive. And there were very strong opinions in the negative that if they became part of that uh, decision, they had ownership of it. And when someone has ownership of an idea, it's very hard for them to, to back out of it. And so we had that um, commitment. And, and it was enthusiastic. I mean, it, was, it was a sense of, of, of community that was developed. And so there was an enormous amount of trust. So through that process, we as a design firm gained an enormous amount of trust that cannot be overstated, that, that level of trust for you being able to lead them through decision-making processes. Does that help? Yeah. So, um, there, so the, the way the project started was in uh, 2008, Baton Hall was renovated. Um, then in 2011, uh, the, the new wing was renovated. The museum actually had contracted with another architect prior to this, prior to this whole process, and it didn't work out. What the museum did was they re-advertised the project locally, and then uh, four firms were shortlisted uh, to compete with each other. Um, NBBJ, um, Moody & Nolan, which, which is a, a large local firm, um, ACOC Associates, which is a smaller firm, uh, sort of design-focused firm, and us. Um, and so we competed. It wasn't a design competition. Uh, it was, um, we went in with our qualifications based on how we understood the museum and what their needs were moving forward. Um, and there were some ideas that were presented. I mean, it wasn't uh, a formal design competition, but each team brought ideas for how they would solve the problem moving forward. Um, and we were selected because ours resonated apparently uh, more than the others did. So it wasn't like one of those formal announced competitions. So uh, I, 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 I feel terrible for not mentioning all of our consultants on this project, uh, one of which um, uh, I mentioned the MKSK, um, SMBH is a local engineering firm that we worked with uh, for structural uh, as, in addition to HEAPI engineering. We also brought in a really great lighting designer. His name is Randy Burkett. Uh, he's based in Kansas City. Um, and he helped us to think through what we, we, we kind of gave him a set of instructions like this is the impression that we're looking for. And because the, the thing that's tricky, again, about a historic building and a new building is that the lighting can be the thing that blows out the original one. And so he helped us to understand what the balancing act was between those and what surfaces to light and what surfaces not to light to, uh, in order to make that happen. Um, we also worked with him because we wanted, we knew that the, the, the east facade was this enormous um, facade that um, needed a little bit of a different character in the evening. And so, I don't know if you noticed this, but um, there was a series of perforated panels which in the daytime look like, the, make the facade look like it's a continuous copper thing. Um, but in the evening, it's illuminated from the ins inside. There's a sort of discrete light source that illuminated that, that uh, created sort of a, a musical effect on that facade. And actually, as we thought about the design of it, those clear stories are part of that movement. And the clear stories are, they have a hierarchy based on their importance in the plan, right? The, big, the one in the center is the big one because that's the main connecting bridge, but the two others uh, are lower in hierarchy. So, but that, that rhythm on that facade was based on that kind of understanding. So, uh, uh, why did we go with a, a copper versus something else that is much more, uh, much different than, than stuff in the neighborhood? Is that what yeah, you're asking? Like the building um, I think there's a, I, I think when, um, it's kind of like when you're like, uh, does anybody here cook? <laughs> when you're like working with ingredients to, to, to cook, um, you're constantly measuring, right? You're, 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 you're looking like this, if you think about this, this context, it's like a big like soup or something. And um, you're thinking about how to balance the, all the ingredients so that, I don't know how to say this, but it just, it tastes right. And so when we were looking at the, um, the, the character of the street, like the, 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 street, the, the street frame, you know, and that, what that street envelope was, and we actually looked at how many buildings were uh, out as far as this potentially was going to be. That actually lines up with the face of the First Congregation Church. That was part of our negotiation with the city to not overwhelm Broad Street, right? Um, and 
as you look at as we looked at the building with the backdrops of the other buildings, um, like for example, the building directly behind it was a, a limestone building. That to us was a cue that it had to be something different, and that 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 that, that copper actually was incredibly strikingly different relative to the buildings next door. And so when you look at it within the context of that steeple there, yeah, it looks like it's, they're like right on top of each other, but actually the difference is, it's, it's pretty far away. You actually have to kind of, as you experience the entire campus, uh, you pick up on that. So um, I, I think the, the reason we didn't go further than copper to something else is because it, 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 the, the recipe would have been shifted because it would have been the wrong ingredient. Yeah, um, great question. So uh, the, the projects that we kind of did early on um, have inspired some other projects in Columbus um, that uh, look to kind of heal some past wounds. Like um, I mentioned that, that one cap project that we were talking, that I mentioned earlier that kind of goes over, uh, it's high street going over six, seven, there are buildings on the other side. The city actually, um, started thinking differently about all their overpasses um, and have started to develop them into, as, into green spaces. You know, with the, the, you know, what Robert Moses did when he you know, dropped the highways down in between you know, the CBDs and the neighborhoods as he kind of cut them off, we have that situation in Columbus where there are older uh, you know, ethnic communities, African American communities that were severed and, and these, these um, bridges now are acting as, as links between them that are developed and actually have uh, cultural heritage um, um, uh, installations uh, associated with them, and they are designed so that in the future you could build on top of them to further kind of mend that. So um, those are the kind of things I think that uh, the project had kind of a residual effect on the, those, those kind of placemaking projects did. Um, specific to our work, um, I mean obviously as we thought about this building and how we blur the boundaries between uh, those kind of outdoor public spaces uh, and the indoor public spaces, in a way that's very universal, um, that's kind of one of the methods that we kind of think about and use is, is, is how you can kind of bring people into the fold and make them feel part of it. And actually, it, for the museum, it's changed the way that they interact. The muse uh, this is one of the things that they share with us. The, the new wing has changed the way that the museum interfaces with the people it serves. And it's done that one way by actually attracting people to work there who, uh, are attracting people that look like themselves. Do you know what I mean? Like so, there are a lot of there are a lot more people from ethnic and African American the African American community that are working in the museum um, uh, staff that are bringing in uh, people that would never have come to the museum before. Um, and it's a really I mean it it, it 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 kind of emphasizes the importance of the role of a cultural agricultural institution to provide that. So I, I'm lucky because I get to work with clients who. That's part of their mission, they do that. And so I think it's sometimes harder if you're working with a developer to understand how do you make uh, perimeter spaces you know, beyond the 1% kind of uh, donation of, to the arts uh, more uh, acceptable and approachable to people. I think that's kind of, I think it varies by developer and client. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Kind of or yes? <laughs> Anyone else? Thank you.